Hey guys, it's the Robert Gardner Wellness Podcast. I'm here today with Christy Miller. Did I get it correct? Yes. I always I always get names wrong. <laughs> when I'm teaching online, it happens all the time. So uh, Christy is an educator in Louisiana, I believe, and I bumped into her online. I can't even, how did we start talking? Do you remember? I think I reached out to you because you posted fish, uh, fish lyrics. Oh, okay. Yeah. And so, I was we, like, hey, fellow fish, fellow music fan, fellow fish <laughs> fan. Yeah, there's not as we many. Can be uh, friends. Yeah, not as many fish fans in Louisiana generally, but uh, it's, uh, it's changed <laughs> over the time. So, Christy, uh, tell the audience like a little bit about you and maybe like how you got into massage and then education. Um, well, I love the question about how I got into it. Um, my grandmother was a massage therapist. I'm a third generation wow. therapist. So uh, there was, when I was in high school, there was a, um, an assignment, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up, basically. So I was talking to my grandmother about it. We call her Gami because the first grandchild couldn't pronounce Granny like she wanted to be, so she's a Gami. So I talked to Gami and asked her what she thought I'd be good at, and she told me about this great lady that she learned from, Susan Salvo, and that she really knew her stuff, and she thought that I would be a great massage therapist, so I went, and here I am. And now yeah. there's seven uh, therapists in my family. My grandmother, my mother, me, and you know, aunts, uncle, and a cousin. Wow. <laughs> so we're a very loving group. Interesting. Yeah, that's a lot in a single family. I don't think I've ever heard of that before, not in that same way. <laughs> so you essentially were raised with massage. I wouldn't say raised because uh, my mother actually went to school after me. Yeah. But my grandmother was the first. She went with her sister. And uh, so I was familiar with it. And it just looked like something really cool that I just wanted to do. I wanted to be able to comfort people. It looked um, powerful in that way. You know, just to be able to offer some support. And uh, so as soon as I graduated high school, I went straight to do massage school in Lake Charles, um, owned by Susan at the time. And uh, I saw I was 17. So it's all that I've is that you know, ever done, Salvo, really. Is that Susan Salvo, by the way? It is. Yeah. <clears throat> it is. I was grateful to have, uh, you know, studied under her. And... Um, you know, I'm grateful to still call her a mentor to this day. She, she's been, you know, instrumental in my every part of my career. Yeah, yeah. I only I'm grateful met, to call uh, her my friend. Yeah, I only met Susan in person uh, at the AMTA convention in El Paso. She's supposed to come on the podcast, I think, in a couple months. Uh, I talked to her about it briefly, so it'll be kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. I uh, originally got my license in Louisiana, and I've had. I don't know. I keep having and losing licenses in Louisiana <laughs> because of regulatory stuff and, you know, paperwork. But it's always interesting dealing with regulation from uh, state to state. And then I don't know as much about, like, Susan's history uh, either. Like, I see her name around, but I don't know much. Well, she's a powerhouse. I mean, she's written uh, several massage therapy textbooks, pathology books. She's a, um, you know, an educator, and uh, she's a doctor of. She has a doctorate in education. She's uh, she's really just a spectacular human and a, a very bright lady. I have a lot of respect for her. Yeah. So, uh, for you, I, I took a quick look at your your website. It looked like you were teaching cupping and some other. Uh, techniques. How did you, after having such a family involved in massage, how did you get involved in education and then like what you're teaching specifically? Um, I just found a love for it over time. Um, Susan actually, uh, a few years after I graduated, she asked me if I'd be interested in teaching at the school. And so I just, you know, developed a love for it. And it's honestly the best, I think it's the best job in the world. There's nothing that I would rather do you know as a job than, than being in being in a classroom you like it more than doing sessions i do yeah i do i like uh connecting with clients i still you know am a massage therapist i still do have clients um but you know over time my focus is shifting more toward education and and in gaining my own as well so uh i'll graduate 
with a bachelor's degree in psychology and um, I plan to graduate in December and then I'll go on to Lamar um, for uh, mental health counseling. So there's just something about the classroom on both sides of the podium that I really enjoy. Yeah, I, I think I was doing Thai massage and then I just knew like I'm only going to be working on one person at a time unless I start teaching this. It was completely unavailable. So I was like, all right, time to teach. <laughs> yeah. I, I know what I can do it. Let, let's go. And uh, yeah. have kind of, I don't know, like I still see clients, but it's not a, uh, a massive focus. There's not a lot of social media push. I'm not run, running ads for clients or anything. I'm trying to increase education and, uh, have teachers underneath my, you know, moniker of next level pain relief and continue to build. There's mm -hmm. a huge market. Um, massage related, like education and business stuff is probably more interesting to me than body work at this point. And when I'm dealing with students, I'm starting to notice that they can pick up the body work itself. But because what I'm teaching is clothes on and mat based, they have a little bit more of a challenge trying to wrap their brain around like the packaging and marketing and sales and the way that it's different. They're like, man, this really is like a different service. And I go, yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, as far as the you asked about the classes that I choose to teach, I, um, I usually write classes around what students are asking me for. Um, so I tend to choose things that uh, help to save therapists' hands. Um, so I like cupping and taping for that reason. Um, and if the client wants it, you know, um, following, you know, evidence-informed practice, I'm not making any claims. Um, if it, I like cupping because it feels good. And uh, if someone knows how to apply that method, I'll be grateful. Um, so I usually um, choose those classes uh, based on need. And then I have included in every PowerPoint um, standards of care for our practice. So I'll uh, go into evidence and warm practice. I'll teach a little bit that I know about li research literacy and documentation just to make sure that people who have been in our industry uh, for a while, I don't know that it was always taught. And I think that some people need to be reminded what the standards of care are and to make sure that we are adhering to those and not going out of our scope of practice. So there's a section in every class that includes uh, that because I think it's important yeah, to I, make sure that people know the levels of evidence and they're yeah. not everything is created equal and at least give it a shot, you know, to try not to, which, uh, you know, I've seen less and less um, pushback on Facebook. Uh, I feel bad for like Alice, and uh, I can't remember her last name, but she was just really fighting for, you know, Jason Erickson and, and just people who are trying to help people, um, you know, the long list of people trying to help us to, to get rid of some of those old notions. And uh, I feel like people are starting to catch on yeah, because I mean, of their work. Face, Facebook group admins get what they deserve. And I, I'm an admin of many groups. It, it drives me absolutely insane. So uh the the science informed side of the bodywork community just needs better marketing like science in general in the united states um i was asked by somebody at the amta what i was most shocked by and i went uh the fact that the american public generally does not like science <laughs> and it's like that includes massage therapists who are like no i want to do my healing work and i'm like uh, uh, okay, yeah. cool. That's cool. That's cool. But uh, like, what about science? I'm, and they're like, nope, don't like science. And I'm like, uh, you're using space technology to communicate with me on Meta about how you don't like science. All right. <laughs> I once read a quote. Um, I saw a quote. It read, "It's difficult to get a man to understand something when his paycheck depends on him not understanding it." Yeah. And uh, there was a time that I was very guilty of perpetuating those old. Um, rumors or whatever you want to call them notion um but thanks to you know leaders in the industry and just being open and being okay with being wrong um being okay with not knowing um yeah it's 
Yeah, the, one of the worst it things I, I can do as a former philosophy student is um, I was totally comfortable after years of college education going, what is the good? What is, what is, what is? And, mm -hmm. and not having an answer. Like, it's it's not like mm -hmm. engineering. Like, you got to get this right or, you know, things fall apart. So when I'm in classes, I'll, I'll ask questions, which is not a very fun way for people to learn in America. They're not, they're not interested in my questions. Does it make sense? They're like, no, um, we, we you want... think that makes them nervous? Um, Cause they think they should know the answer to everything. I think there's a whole, a whole mix of things, including my background and their background where, um, just for an example, when I was a philosophy student at LSU, I, I became aware of this one day where we had a humanities requirement. So if like you were an engineer or a mathematician, you had to have a humanities, a certain number of classes or courses or something. So somebody would take a philosophy class as like a one-off and it would be like ethics or bioethics, something I was in as part of my major. And the, the look of like steam coming out of a guy's ears when the professor was like, yeah, you're just going to write a three page essay and there's not really any right or wrong answer. And they're having a conniption and I'm like, huh? What, like about what? And it's like, oh, well, they're engineers. Like there's a right answer. <laughs> uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> like there's a definitive, that bridge has got to operate according to certain right. fiscal laws, you know, but like, we're like, no, we're just talking about, you know, Nietzsche and Thrasymachus and, you know, it's just, a, you know, no. You know, I'm comfortable asking questions, and when I get to the edge of my my knowledge base, you know, I feel like Socrates just walking around the agora, just ask, hey, let's ask ask questions. Me and Plato hanging out. You know, the students do not like that. Western education, the way it's doled out in America currently, is very like top down. We we tell you what the truth is, and you regurgitate the information. It's not a place to like ask questions. Does it make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. So the students are like, been, well, what do I do? And I go, ooh, um, communicate with the client. And they're like, oh, can't you just tell me what to do? And I'm like, the problem is if I choose two techniques, one technique's going to work for one client and not for the other. Mm -hmm. Go with your gut. Communicate with the client. Uh, that's a problem. Go with your gut. And they're like, oh, I don't know. I had Wendy's earlier. I don't know. <laughs> 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 it's just the thing about education itself. I was sort of weaned in that philosophical sort of thought experiment and I'm very comfortable with that. But I realized that students wanted like the foundation. So I wind up teaching sequences and the duality I get caught in is they want me to dispense the truth. So I give them the sequence and then they go, well, this sequence doesn't fit my client. And I go, communicate with the client uh -huh. and it's yeah. between sequence and improvisation and if i teach them sequences they want to improvise and if i teach them to improvise they ask what the sequence is and i'm like just keep working at it <laughs> here's both here's both <laughs> yeah <laughs> so how do you deal with uh students questions since we're in that in that duality between sequences and improvisation because mm -hmm. the students have to have enough of a background to feel comfortable improvising to start com mm -hmm. feel comfortable start stepping outside the box and mm -hmm. the foundational work they're taught in school I, like i never looked i never thought anything of it when i was in massage school to learn like a swedish sequence it was like yeah mm -hmm. you just memorize a sequence but in no way did i ever feel like the teachers are like you have to do just this you can't you can't vary from this this is a sacred sequence and people kind of get like that with time massage. And I'm like, mm, I don't think that's how that works. Yeah. Um, I welcome questions. I like uh, students to, to feel comfortable enough to ask a question. And, um, and I like to feel comfortable enough to maybe not know the answer, but I'll help, help you find it if I don't know the answer. We can find it together or it'll be a bonus on our next test. Yeah. Um, but I, you know, I, I always disclose that I'm you know, I try very hard to because anatomy is tough, you know, teaching anatomy, physiology, patho, uh, kinesis, like it's, these are tough subjects. Um, and so 
I, I just try to stay open to being wrong, being humble about it, and trying to find the answer. And then we all know if I don't. Yeah, like you mentioned uh, scope of practice. And scope of practice gets interesting because it'll change slightly from state to state based on like laws. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I do with Texas students all the time. I'm like, have you guys, have you guys read the law? And they're like, well, no. And I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. So you don't, yeah. <laughs> you don't even know what, <laughs> what you operate under. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes. I um, definitely like to go into that to, uh, to read, you know, the practice act, what's in, what's out. Some of the, so that we'll know less progressive states. I'll put it that way. That sounds good. That's a very clean clinical. The less progressive states in the United States sometimes have some of the stricter massage laws and they'll just they'll just confuse me sometimes. So I uh, somebody contacted me from Mississippi. They wanted me to come in and teach. So I had to do like a little bit of research and then I had to file with Mississippi's board and then I think Mississippi had to approve the curriculum and it was like this ongoing fiasco, but when I looked at Mississippi's law, they specifically did not allow visceral manipulation. And the whole time I looked at it, I went, so you can't do abdominal massage in Mississippi? Like, how are you guys defining... Like, visceral. Yeah, like, and, and that's the thing. It's like, when students... Or manipulation. When students contact me and they have a question, they're in South Dakota, let's say, and they're like... I'm, I'm an NCB, TMB approved, home study, like I have home study courses online, whatever. They go, can I get credit for your course? And I go, I don't know. And they're like, what do you mean you don't know? And I'm like, there are 50 sets of laws. Mm -hmm. I do not live in South Dakota. You're only responsible for one and you don't know. <laughs> mm -hmm. Why do you expect me to know 49 other states? My own home state, I'll tell you very quickly, uh, I taught a class online once I got really cooking with my multicam setup. Um, taught a class online, and Texas does not allow hands on instruction online. My home state during COVID never waived any rules regarding hands on instruction and online stuff. Online CE credit is only allowed for like theory or business or something like that. Makes sense? Doesn't matter if it's pre recorded or live. Let me think about this for a second. So in Texas, so I, whether it's pre-recorded or live, I think the challenge is Texas has a blanket rule. You can't teach any hands-on instruction through these cameras. Mm -hmm. It's not, not allowed for CE credit. Now, other states during COVID tweaked that and said, well, you know, we're having, a, it's COVID. We don't want people spreading. Texas was like, Oh well, <laughs> they didn't. They didn't allow what I'm doing at all, uh, teaching online. So long story short, I taught a class online. I was teaching Thai style foot massage in the mat based section. A lady in Arkansas called and started cursing me out and my Bluetooth and whatever. Uh, got pretty angry at me because I got mouthy with her for calling me and cursing me out during class, and then reported me to TDLR. <laughs> So a lady I've never met, who's never taken an in-person class with me, who's never had a session with me, reported me because of something I said on the internet. And TDLR is like, are you doing, and I'm like, hold on, hold on. You One, you have a recording of the entire interaction I had with the lady, because she called her in class. I, she gave you a copy of the recording. You saw what happened. Mm -hmm. The Texas Department of licensing and regulation does not allow CE online for hands-on instruction in Texas. And they're like, correct. They're like, are you teaching CE? I'm like, no, hold on, hold on. I live in Texas. People come study with me. People can take my online classes, but if they're in Texas, I'm not responsible if they're trying to file courses that they know they can't file because there's a blurb on my website that says, listen, Texas blocks 75% of what I'm doing. Like it, it's, it's a very dangerous precedent when somebody out of state can report me and get me in, in trouble with the Texas state board and they're asking all these questions. And I'm like, listen, if the Texas 
let's see, Texas Department of Licensing and Regulation doesn't allow hands-on instruction online. How is anything I do online within the purview of TDLR? And if I ask that, they'll go, well, we're not at liberty to interpret the law. And I go, it's the lawyers. It's the lawyers. So you don't interpret laws that you're enforcing? <laughs> Like, okay, guys, you know, and, and in the end, everything was fine. It was just, you know, this, this lady and whatever, no, no charges were pressed. I didn't have to go to TDLR and defend myself, but mm -hmm. it's put me in a weird uh, situation because I wound up teaching online because I felt blocked by school owners and industry leaders who don't think very well of online education and my clients are completely clothed. I haven't had anybody take off clothes in eight years. My students are completely closed. I haven't had anybody take off clothes in eons. So I just film and photo document everything and teach online and everybody's like, no, but you can't. And I'm like, can't what? And they're like, but we don't, you're not following the rules. And I go, yes, but I have a lawyer and I don't break the law. We don't like that guy. He's not... He's just like on the internet asking questions. We don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so where were we? <laughs> we were talking about law. Oh, good lord! I'll never. I should have been a lawyer. That I really miss my calling. I if I had to do it over again, I'd just go to law school because I I love it. <laughs> you like to debate. Oh, it, it's my true, if I had a true gift, um, I've had people argue <laughs> with me on, on Facebook before and just call me names and tell me I'm fat. And I'm like, hey, you want to debate me right now? We'll go live on a podcast. I'll, I'll, I'll debate you right now. No scripts, nothing. Let's go. Everybody declines, of course, but <laughs> it's like it could, it could get brutal. <laughs> Yeah, it's just different than uh, I think the way most people are thinking about education itself. Again, there's this weird like top-down model. We we tell you what to think, and you just regurgitate the information and follow suit. Yeah, me me just doing something. This is this is how radical my curriculum was. I went, hey guys, why don't we work on a mat? And if you really let that sit, it's like a burr in your ass. <laughs> They're like, but this destroys the entire found. I'm like, I know. <laughs> it's like something as simple as working on a mat with somebody clothed is like, oh my God, this is, this is crazy. And it's like. I didn't realize you would get so much pushback from that. Well, mat work represents less than 1% of the entire massage marketplace. I think that makes it more interesting and fun. It is not allowed at any major facility in the United States. There's only one facility in all of Austin that I can think of that even allows mat-based work. And Austin has a popular, Austin is the cool city, right? The progressive city in Texas. There's 1.6 million people here. There's one facility. Wow, I was not aware of that. Yeah. Well, in Louisiana, how many mat-based practitioners? I don't know. And it's like every, every day students come into my subscribers group and they're like, do you know anybody in Massachusetts? And I'm like, good luck. Like you got to do some Google searches because again, it's, it's made me a, a bit of a pariah just working differently. It's not mm -hmm. really socially acceptable yet. It's not, it's not esteemed. Does it make sense? It's not like, Ooh, <laughs> The mat work is like something advanced. They're just like, I don't know, that's weird. I, don't, I, I do massage. I don't know what that is. Do you have any interest in doing tabletop tie? Are you? I, I still teach it, but the only reason I teach it is because it's like training wheels to get them to the mat. Okay. Yeah, I'll be taking one of your classes. Yeah. yeah that sounds the, like a lot of fun. The therapists across the board, what I see is they think I'm like I'm anti table. And I go, no, 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 hold on. You haven't understood my teaching. I'm pro mat. There's a difference. And like, I allow table work. Your industry doesn't allow mat work. And they're like, what? And I'm like, okay, did you learn mat work at school? 
Are you allowed to practice it in the facilities you work at? Are educators promoting? No. Like, your industry is anti-mat. I'm pro-mat. <laughs> That's about as simple as I can make it. Now, w once I added doing crazy mat work, clothes on before camera angles, teaching interactively live during COVID, I went, oh, we got some, we got some bigger issues. <laughs> so are you primarily um, running your own practicing clients and then uh, teaching as a side gig? I feel like everything that I'm doing is part time. So I, um, yeah. I have a, a, a great building, great little building, and we have, um, I, I would call it a co-op. Everybody owns their own business inside. Uh, there's, um, so I have a massage room. I think there's nine therapists total. And then we also have, um, a, a person who does waxing and then a person who is an esthetician. And she also has this great, a therapy uh, float tank, so one with the salt water, and and so you know I manage that. Um, I guess everybody's managing themselves; they have their own businesses. Um, but yeah, I do a, a bit of massage, a bit of teaching, um, and even I don't think I've ever taken more than twelve hours uh, in a semester. So it's a lot of uh, things to fill out a day, yeah. and everything's pretty much part time. Mm -hmm. And then uh, at the massage school, uh, the way that uh, it's the Louisiana Institute of Massage Therapy, and there are three classes that go on at, at a time. So it's every other weekend, so alternating weekends. So that's two classes. And then the class that I teach is the weekday class. And so that's just a seven-month uh, course. It's a 500-hour course. Um, so uh, teach it my, you know, most of the teaching that I do there is, you know, from October to March. So it's kind of seasonal in that way. Are you, and let me be clear about this, um, you don't own a massage school, do you? I do not. Okay, but you teach at a massage school in addition to providing CE? Correct. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I've so, man, you, you are spread out. 95. Yeah. 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 But everything's part time, and it's just perfect for my little, for my ADHD brain, yeah. just to keep everything interesting and keep me occupied. Yeah, I love the, it. The one thing I'm I didn't thrilled. do was start uh, teaching in core curriculum. I, I very much felt like CE was going to allow me a certain degree of freedom to ask those questions. If I go into core curriculum, it's going to destroy the school. <laughs> <laughs> like they're gonna they're gonna seed a rebellion from a bunch of anarchists who are like down with the table, you know. It's like weird. Yeah. <clears throat> and then the the teaching process. I think because I'm a teacher, I'm interested in this. Like, I have uh, deeper emotional bonds with the students who are trying to like wrap their brain around what I'm teaching and helping clients and, and working in a different way. The teaching process, is that primarily what you love is sort of the connection with the students to be able to see them grow and develop? Absolutely. And I love watching the connection that they build with each other. So uh, first day of class, we take a group picture, everyone's occupying their own space. And by the end, uh, by the last class, you know, the, the last group picture, everyone is hugging and they're on, you know, um, they've, they've gelled. And that's, yeah. that is the goal of every class that I teach is to get them to connect with one another, um, to teach, you know, empathy for one another. And I think my uh, classes in psychology have helped me as a teacher in the classroom because, well, not only am I sitting there as a student, watching a an instructor excel or maybe not um but maybe sometimes as a student i struggle and so i have more empathy toward them on the days that maybe they're not able to give their best because of it's something that they've got going on yeah but there was a fly i swear yeah i um i think about uh, my core curriculum sometimes like a tease at students because i graduated in 2002 <clears throat> And I got a B in anatomy. <laughs> so it's hard. The, yeah. the way I 
dealt with school because I was a very dedicated student, but not a morning person. And students, or I should say teachers in school never had any problems with me because I was, you know, I don't know, intelligent, engaged and wanting to learn. But going back and like, I never thought in a million years when I was sitting in that school, like I would be teaching CE classes years later, like didn't even, it was just like, I'm just here learning massage. So I get my massage license. Like I don't, mm -hmm. I had no, no notion of that at all. Mm -hmm. Um, well, I, I guess I was led mostly by Susan. She kept, you know, suggesting things. Hey, have you thought about going to, Get your degree. Have you thought about this? Have you thought about this? Well, okay, let me try it. Let me try it. Let me try it. And um, so I've just taken steps forward. Um, and, you know, if it felt good, I kept doing it. And I've been uh, teaching since 2005. And, I, you know, with anatomy, there's always something more to learn. I've just never lost the passion for it. You know, new groups of students come in and just to see people light up. Um, sometimes... Students don't think that they can do it. Yeah. And I love watching them excel. It never gets old. Yeah, there's... Whew, man. Uh, the students and like the questions they ask, because I'm teaching CE, and you can tell they're trying to wrap their brain around, like, how did you know to do... And I go, I've been doing this for 20 years, and Kate just told me. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. like I'll hook into something and go, Kate, you like more towards the shoulder or more towards the spine? And she's like, oh, towards the spine. I'm like, cool. You like want to go up towards the head or down towards your feet? And she's like, yeah. oh, down toward my feet. And they're like, yeah. how did you know to do that? And I'm like, well, she just told me. <laughs> yeah. What did your last therapist do that you enjoyed? What did your last therapist do that you didn't like? Okay, great. Let's do that. Or let's not do that. Ooh, man, I... Students, at the point I'm at right now, students are having a business problem because they're not confident enough in mat work to just go whole hog. So they're like, no, but my clients want massage and I went to massage school. And I go, so why don't we give them a better service for pain management? And they're like, no, but they're asking for massage. And I go, why don't we give them a better service for pain management? And they're like, no, that's not what they're asking. I'm like, it's not what you're promoting. Like, if you promote the service you want to deliver, if it is mat based, the st the clients will buy it. Like, I worked with a uh, Kristen for four years, and it was hilarious because she went to On It recently, which is this crazy total human optimization gym, and she did a little demo with Wendy, and they were giving away little twenty minute sessions, I think. And Kristen freaked out. She's like, they love it, and I'm like, yes, yeah. <laughs> it's like. <laughs> Yeah, that's like, what we're doing here. <laughs> that's not new, Kristen. Like, of course they love it. it. It's like I keep telling her, I'm like, we don't have issues with the clients. We have issues with massage therapists who don't want to change. Like, mm -hmm. fundamentally, it becomes like a completely different pra practice once it's mat based. W once I take effleurage away as the foundation, the therapists are like, what? what do I do? And I'm like, you should follow the sequence. And they're like, oh, but this is like really long. <laughs> and I think that's just going to be an issue for the rest of my life. I don't see how, how I avoid that. I just keep teaching, clarifying, making shorter sequence sequences, making it easier for the students, more sequential, succinct, um, and you just make more video continue to show it. It's kind of like, I don't know. A dishwasher still washes dishes. It just does it in a different way than using your hands and, a, you know, a sponge and a sink. That's all. I like to try to uh, encourage students and help them to uh, gain a little bit of confidence by saying, hey, these techniques have been around a long time. They're not going to be any better just because I'm doing it. Um, I think that focus and intention, like I, I it, <laughs> there's something about um, maybe techniques um, aren't, they all work in exactly, exactly the same way, maybe. So if that were true, then maybe um, 
focusing more on your intentions. So, you know, what's your intention? What are you trying to, what did the client ask you for? Trying to focus on that might be more important. Um, so I don't know where I was going with that. But. The students, uh, the, the constant <clears throat> discussion I have is, I, I want you to stop being a service provider and start being a problem solver. And they go, not no, an interactor. No, but they, but the clients are asking for massage. And I go, I was a philosophy student. What is massage? And they're like, no, but Robert, everybody knows what massage is. And I'm like, really? I don't. And I have three licenses in Texas. <laughs> It's like the service provider as an artist, they're kind of almost the clients are allowing them to almost force the students into a box where it's like they want to deliver this specific service that the client is asking for. The client is never going to understand the full expression of what body work can be, nor should they be expected to. That's for the yeah, artist. They don't need to. They yeah. want to have a good experience, so we yeah. try to give them that whatever way that means to them. Yeah. Like, I, I talk to students. It get, it, conversations in class get brutal. I'm like, guys, do, does any, do any of you ever ask yourselves how I created the business I created? Because it was not because of my stellar good looks and award-winning personality. There it is. <laughs> it's because the work is effective. <laughs> Anybody can learn it. Anybody can do it and, you know, social skills help or whatever, but it's this interesting thing because you're trying to get them to think outside the box. You're trying to get them to, you know, create, promote different services. Like if they, if they're having a problem with what I teach specifically, like they don't understand the mat thing, I go, listen, let's, let's take a branded service like Watsu. Watsu is available. Massage therapists know that Watsu exists. There is no major, to my knowledge, chain that offers Watsu in the United States. Aquatic therapies aren't even on the map. And if I ask why, it's like, well, infrastructure, and they'd have to have a pool, which is much harder to set up in a commercial setting. It's, you know, mm -hmm. more, more, there's a very strategic thing, like you got to have a, a pool that would allow you to do that. They kind of understand that. And I'm like, so what about mat work? Less materials, less laundry, cheaper, quicker, faster. It's got all the advantages of chair massage. It's completely clothed. You can film and photo document everything to promote your practice. I'm like, where's the mat work? And they're like, Robert, this is, this is crazy. And I'm like, I know, I'm certifiable. If we, if we go to a counselor, I'm totally certified. You can you can just stamp me crazy. It's great, but it doesn't mean that my discussion doesn't have veracity. <laughs> it doesn't mean that the work is less effective. It's just a model mm -hmm. that the the industry is not currently allowing at the moment. One of the most interesting things for me was to see pre COVID, about a year before COVID, Stretch Lab and Stretch Zone started to open up everywhere. And I was like, ooh, this looks, ooh, this looks just like table tie. And all these stretch facilities, yoga teachers, personal trainers are all doing the stretch service and massage therapists start to get angry and go, well, they don't have a massage license. And I'm like, they're not doing massage, they're doing stretch. I'm like, no, they need a massage license. And I'm like, not according to my Google research. <laughs> it's like, that was the terrain I kept telling therapists to pick up and use. And they kept saying, but no, well, my clients want massage. And it was like, they, they left like this huge chunk of real estate, you know, around that the yoga, te yoga teachers, personal trainers, and people picked up. But when I have conversations about it, it gets, whoo, it gets heated real fast. Massage therapists don't like it, but it's like, I don't think massage law really does what they think it does, if that makes sense. What have you found? Um, are you traveling from state to state? Yes. I, um, next to my love of teaching, the next best is travel. So travel. we have an RV that I've been using uh, to take 
Uh, I've been to uh, Albuquerque a couple of times to teach at a massage school there. Um, in June, I'm going to go to Abita Springs, and I have a uh, Roan State in Nashville, near Nashville. Um, what is it in Nashville? And it's just Roan State. It's, I think it's a community, community college. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. So, yes, I have, I've started to do more traveling and teaching. And that's, um, I mean, that's, that's the fun part. So the yeah. goal for every, every uh, journey is to, of course, teach, meet some new great people and uh, see and see something I've never seen and taste something delicious. There's a, um, an interesting thing I noticed as I started traveling to realize there was a sort of massage culture. And the massage culture changed from state to state and region to region. What do you give me an example? Um, if you go west and get towards the coast, you're going to hit more loamy and more water influenced sort of body work. If you get into different regions that have rules about like abdominal work, some like local schools don't teach it. So there's just like small variations in massage culture itself that I think are mm -hmm. un unexplored. Yeah. If you go to Arkansas, the, the hot springs, the hot springs have an effect on the culture around the massage and the stuff around it. And it's just those little things that I find super interesting where Asian styles of body work, unfortunately, get a little bit of a, a knock in the industry because of concerns related to like human trafficking and prostitution. So if you wind up on the West Coast again in larger cities, you have a larger uh, Asian immigrant population. So you're getting more shiatsu, mm -hmm. Thai massage, other stuff. There's there mm -hmm. a lot of it in Central Texas. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Um, so I understand. So depending on the region, the laws, the culture, um, the style changes from place to place. Yeah. 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 That makes sense. Yeah. Like there was a, I, 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 I looked for this video cause I thought this was glorious. So it's like, it ain't my style, but I just was like totally blown away. There was a guy who, um, he did Lomi or some Polynesian style of work um, and there was a video that came out and I, I've looked for this video and I can't find it. If anybody's out there and you know where this video is, send it to me. Um, he was a Lomi practitioner uh, and I call it Lomi because that's the closest name I have to whatever Polynesian art. He had apparently studied in Hawaii. He had studied in some of the other Polynesian islands. He was working around Miami or something somewhere in Florida. <clears throat> And he had a young lady on his table, looked like she was 19 and nothing but a thong. And he was oiled up and had a sarong on. He was covered in oil and he was doing this dancey, flashy. He did this Harlem Globetrotter stuff at one point. She was on her back. He lifted up her arm and his arm was, was oiled. So her leg slid down his arm and he ducked his head and like went to the other side. At some point he's doing the work and like the table lit up underneath. Like one of those cars, you know what I'm saying? And I saw that and I was like, gold. I was like, that guy's gonna, that guy's gonna make a million dollars. Every woman <laughs> wants to be that young lady on the table and every therapist wants to make the money he's making. And massage <laughs> therapists were so angry because it was too sensual and it over-sexualized the work. And I go, eh. Like, it's, it's part of his marketing. He does this Polynesian style of work. It, com it comes from a different culture. Um, mm -hmm. I thought as a marketing thing, it's not what I would do, but I was like, it's a total win. Nobody pays attention to my videos on YouTube because it's not sexy. <laughs> like I had somebody write me the other day and they're, I don't know, like commenting on me being fat or whatever. And I'm just like, here we go again. The, the challenge is like, what do people want to see? Like what's interesting in a social media environment and context? I thought his work was amazing. Like if you were looking for that style of work, I thought he did a great job of promoting it. Mm -hmm. The the level of like, you know, entrepreneurial that it took to get your table to light up underneath. I'm just like gold. I was cinem <laughs> cinematic gold. Like, you know, uh, therapists were complaining. He charges $50 more an hour than anybody else in town. I'm like, and he deserves it and probably gets it. <laughs> that thing about marketing 
advertising, packaging, that stuff with massage culture is like different from region to region. Um, I've seen therapists argue about the Esalen Institute and nudity, and I'm like, have you ever been to Esalen? And they're like, no, and I'm like, oh, dude, it's, I can't even, that's like not even part of the United States, man. That fell off on the ocean years ago. Um, sauna culture, Turkish baths, um, things like that. It's like in other countries and cultures, the way they deal with stuff. Like, have you seen those crazy Indian barbers doing that crazy head massage? It's all rapid with the oil. I've seen the um, the one where it's slow. Is it called Shower Dara? I don't know yeah. how to pronounce it. Yeah, I think that's God, more like that I- Ayurveda. Heavenly. Yeah, and, and yeah. I don't know where the, the, the crazy guys <laughs> I see on TikTok because <laughs> they're like going in somebody's <laughs> ear and they're like real rapid. But it's like contextually, I think you wouldn't get that in the States. You know, it's like you're you're blending disciplines. And to give you a quick idea, I went to Greece and Turkey years ago as part of a, a exchange. Uh, I went overseas to study and I got to Istanbul. We went to little, <laughs> the oldest hammam in Istanbul and some Turkish guy took me and scrubbed me with a loofah and laid my ass out on a marble and like cracked my neck and did all this stuff. And you're like, this is not the United States. Yeah. And it's like, was it a cleansing ritual? Was it a bath? Was it a massage? Was it a chiropractic adjustment? <laughs> it's like... All it's, of the above. Yeah, and, and that's the thing. It's like contextually, it's just, it's a little more compartmentalized in the United States. And it affects the way people look at, you know, culture itself. Like, mm-hmm. the culture of nudity at Esalen, um, when I when people are like, that's weird, those people are naked. And I'm like, hold on, have you been to Esalen? And they're like, no. And I'm like, okay. So there is the baths where the massages go down and the baths are right near the, the hot tubs, basically the hot springs. These are naturally fed hot springs full of sulfur. You go sit in them. They're awesome. The first day you go out, it's a little strange because you could take a shower and then you go naked. And if you're like me, you, you very timidly run and jump in the hot tub, you know, to cover yourself up. But after you're there for a month, every day you go to the hot, <laughs> to the hot springs. You were there for a month? Yeah. So the goal is, if we get the next level trade, uh, next, level, next level pain relief trademark, if we get re- the registered mark, I'm going to contact Esalen and try to do like a month long retreat there, so that students can come in and stay, and we can like you know expand on the work in like a, a retreat context. Um, and that's essentially what I did with my teacher many years ago. Is I was a teaching assistant, so I went hung out for a month saw these people coming and going at the Esalen Institute. It's got a lot of crazy history with it. It's a very wonderful place. But the thing about the hot springs is like the tubs are right here, the massage place is over here. So your therapist will come and get you. You're in the tubs. You just stand up naked, walk over and get your massage. Mm -hmm. But it's so interesting because there's, again, there's a sort of cultural context at the facility. Like you get used to being completely naked with someone and then going to the lodge 15 minutes later and having a conversation with somebody completely clothed. It's like, it, it's like, again, it just, it doesn't even feel like part of the United States. Culturally, it's like something fell off in the ocean years ago. Mm -hmm. And those cultural contexts are like sort of what we're dealing with in the massage industry. Like there is a massage culture. And the massage mm-hmm. culture wouldn't even open enough open enough at that time to like allow stretching, though that has changed because of stretch lab and stretch zone, other larger mm-hmm. um, you know, corporations, businesses that are having stretch therapy now. So it's it's just mm-hmm. interesting. Like I'm seeing lots more in video, I'm seeing lots more movement and stretching than I did say five years ago. Like it seems to be growing. And all of the massage championships. Have you looked at those? Yeah. They look fun. I mean, I I wonder if they're really trying to see who's the best or just uh, being more playful. I think it's turned some people off to hear the word championship. Ah, People are making money. Let them go make money. (laughs) It's it's still a place for people to network and learn and... Right off of vacation. They'll contact me and ask me if I'll compete. And I go, yes but I will do the most intentionally effective and boring session you have ever seen. I will, I will hold one spot for five minutes and communicate with the client. Like I will intentionally lose 
and they're like, Robert, you're mocking us. And I'm like, yes. <laughs> it's like, I, it's totally cool that other people love it and want to have a competition, but it just seems a little strange to me. Yeah. I think it's strange if someone takes it really seriously and, you know, I am the best, you know, I think that would be strange, but just go into have fun and um, have a new experience and just see people um, kind of showing off their craft, I suppose. If, yeah. if you look at it in more of a lighthearted way, I think it could be fun. Yeah. And I don't know. It was just like the AMTA convention. I've only been to another one years ago that was in New Braunfels here in Texas. So going to El Paso and then a totally different area of Texas and teaching was kind of interesting. And again, uh, just cultural uh, cultural shifts and changes from like region to region. El Paso felt a bit more like almost New Mexico to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there was a, a slightly different uh, vibe than what I thought it would be. Mm -hmm. I was scared when I uh, went to New Mexico to teach um, because it's a very spiritual area, you know, Native American population. And I was afraid that um, maybe more of a science-based perspective would not be re well received. And so I was very careful by how I packaged it, where this is, this is uh, from my perspective, but it's not, uh, I'm not trying to stomp on anybody's beliefs or, or anything. I'm actually uh, welcoming your opinions and your experiences if you want to share with the class. And, um, and, you know, I was um, surprised that that it, it was, you know, well received. I think it's just in the way that you present it, that everybody is welcome. Everyone's opinion is important and we want to share. Uh, it kind of brought, it brought the class together. Yeah, I don't, I, I only, uh, well, I've learned to be less contentious. This is the less contentious, Robert. <laughs> Um, I don't bring it up a lot, and the major issue that I've seen is teaching time massage, they're expecting some sort of energy work, and I keep asking questions about science, and they go, no, we don't want science, we want Asian magic, and I'm like, you want Asian magic from a white guy who grew up in South Louisiana, who yeah. teaches the body work from some people from Southeast Asia? And they're like, yeah, and I'm mm. <laughs> like, energy work. Let me have a let me have a beer. Let's let's sit down and talk about this energy. What is energy? And they're like, no, no, Robert, no. I'm like, what does Neil deGrasse Tyson got to say about this? Bill, not a science guy. What about science? What about double blind research studies? And they're like, no, no, we want magic. And I'm like, ooh, man, you people vote. <laughs> You're raising children? Good God. <laughs> it, be, it would be easy to sell, though, wouldn't it? The science? No, the magic is easier oh. to sell. I see why it's so uh, appealing, why it's um, yeah. tempting to a lot of teachers. It gets, it gets dangerously close. One of the things I find interesting is... If you talk about cults, um, so Austin is, is it an hour or two from Waco? Um, so occasionally those will come out of a class, like people talk about cults or something. And cults are generally looked down upon because there is a cult leader and then the followers. But the way education is dealt with in the West seems to be very top down. Like the, the guru tells you what to believe and then you you know, give up free will and thinking and do as you're told. And I have a, like a, a bias sort of against that. And then you come to find out that students go to the massage school or go to an educator like me, and they kind of just want me to dispense the truth to them. And I feel very uncomfortable with that situation because it feels a little culty to me. And people would joke with me. They're like, oh, Robert, you're, you're like a cult leader. And I'm like, okay, cool. We've got a cult. I was like, there's tax exemptions. That's great. We like that, you know. <laughs> and they're like, then they go, but Robert, you could have a compound. And I'm like, no, 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 no. You don't have compounds mm -hmm. in Texas. We burn those to the ground. No, no. You can have a ranch, but you do not have a compound in Texas. Do not call your place compound. Like, 
this is not not negotiable you're never calling anything i'm involved with a compound <laughs> the challenge is i ask questions because i don't know and i'm comfortable with that sort of socratic ignorance i'm trying to get the students to look at science based education and just ask better questions to be a little more inquisitive but mm -hmm. i also don't want to force them like part of the reason i taught send lines in my first uh, time massage workbook was i wanted students to be able to leave my class go study with someone else and be like oh these are those send lines he was talking about without them being shocked does it make sense mm -hmm. but it created this weird thing because as i continued teaching they were like well what about the magic lines and i was like Oh, that was just a, a map that the teacher gave the student and said, go do 10,000 sessions. And they're like, no, but they're like magic lines. And I'm like, no, those are a simple map that a teacher gave to the student. And they're like, no, but the, the loam and the, it runs through the sin and, you know, this magic. And I, I did this at AMTA because I taught a Thai style foot massage class. I made this mistake years ago. I taught a Thai style foot massage class and called it reflexology. The students in class got angry because I wasn't going to teach them how to stimulate the liver through the feet. Mm -hmm. And I learned and, and changed the name to Thai style foot massage. And at the AMTA convention, I said, and I quote, I said, in Thai massage, it's loam and sin. In Ayurveda, it's prana and nadis. And in Chinese medicine, it's meridians and chi. Which of those holds up to scientific scrutiny? And some student loudly outside of my field of vision said, all of them. And I went, that's not how science works. Now, what we're doing here with the feet is we're going to mobilize and stretch the plantar surface of the feet while we deliver some pressure right here. And I just moved on because I'm not here to debate it, but I'm trying to like slowly open brains and what i found out during covid is the american public doesn't like science very much <laughs> it was a it was a rough spot in the industry yeah i try to avoid those um you know because people get upset so that's what prompted me to include standards of care uh, to include research literacy um to to show um the pyramid the hierarchy of evidence pyramid yeah. I, I feel like it it helped me uh to not have a lot of that kind of bickering about who was right and um you know okay I, i'm willing to to receive that let's let's find an article that supports it and and how would that measure up to this one yeah there's there's a, a thing and i it's a little bit like that duality between teaching a sequence and improvisation. You get, you get stuck in this because they'll say they don't want a cult leader, but then they kind of go, well, can you just tell us what to think? And I'm like, mm, I don't feel real comfortable with that at all. Mm -hmm. That's kind of contrary to even how I interact in the world. That doesn't really, you know, like I'm mm -hmm. a massage educator wearing an easy E t-shirt. <laughs> like I ain't typical. Uh, students yeah. occasionally they're, they'll say this, they're like, Robert, I don't know you like in your videos, you curse. And that's like, it makes me a little uncomfortable. And I'm like, it's easier for me to turn on the cameras and be authentic. And that way, when you come to class and find out I curse, it's not a surprise. You don't report me to TDLR and say he's using profanity. Like I don't have to deal with any of that. Like, you know, that the curse comes with the price of admission. <laughs> It's like, I didn't want to have a job, I guess, if you want to call it that, where I was constantly putting on a facade. Mm -hmm. And part of that uh, thing in education is just to ask people, why does this work? Because they think it's like I'm teaching magic techniques. And it's like, no, I'm just manipulating soft tissue. Like, this isn't. It didn't even fundamentally all that different on a table. It's like I choose to use a mat because I think it gives you more access to more tools. But it's like the massage culture is interesting to me because the more I understand it, the more I want to like crack it open and create new potential for the, the students to be able to interact in. And that 
has its own like marketing challenge. It's like I, I always feel like an anarchist when I run into any school with this device and go, global distribution. And they go, yeah, we don't, we don't allow that here. People are naked. And I go, oh, okay, uh, whatever. <laughs> Do you go into other schools in Louisiana and teach, or are you just at your kind of your home base? Um, recently, I went to a school in Lafayette. Um, just to, yeah, uh, a friend of mine was teaching there and just invited me to go and show the students what uh, a little bit about cuffing and hot bamboo massage, which is um, being requested quite a bit these days. That's really fun. It doesn't get as warm as the uh, hot stone, so you don't have that burn risk, um, but they're still warm and they feel nice. Um, yeah. So I went there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Lafayette, New Orleans are my, my two favorite places in Louisiana, though I grew up in Baton Rouge. Yeah, my heart lives in New Orleans. I have family that lives down the bayou from uh, Venice and Buras, and uh, my grandmother would come to pick me up every summer. And so when I saw uh, the Superdome, you know, just there's great things to come. So even yeah. as a kid, because it was a, you know, a fun summer of hanging out in, in the pool at my grandmother's house. So the, um, so, being near New Orleans has always signified some fun, yeah. something fun about to happen. I, 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 I love growing it. up there, you didn't, like, culture, right? Like, I didn't realize how, like, immersed in Louisiana culture I was until I moved to Pennsylvania, near Lancaster <laughs> County, where the Amish are. And I remember yeah. being, being in my Honda Accord, <laughs> being 22, yeah, 22 years old, and being behind an Amish buggy, and I was like... This is not Louisiana, man. Yeah. Oh, God, this okay. is, oh my God. I was like, these people are apple pie and butter all day long. Like, ain't no gumbo, ain't no blues, ain't no jazz, ain't no funk. Like, like ain't no Grigory. What is going on? Ain't no Dr. John, ain't no meters. You know, where's the brass band? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Just totally different. Yeah. That's yeah. where... One of my, my bigger goals, I tell people, is I kind of want to be like Tony Bourdain, but add the component of body work. So I go to Oaxaca, Mexico. I live there for six months. I mm -hmm. eat the food, document the culture, go to the tequila distilleries, and find the local curanderas and see who's doing massage in Oaxaca, like what exists there. Cause, oh wow! I've never That's seen, I've never seen anybody do it, and then it's like, okay, now let's go to Egypt. Now, what's going on here? That Saudi Saudi Arabia, you know, or wh wherever in the world. Like that's p part of the dream, and it's like the same thing I said about massage culture in the United States. It's a little more standardized across fifty states, but once you get out of the country, I suspect it changes pretty radically. That would be a very cool thing to do. That yeah. sounds like a dream. Yeah. Good idea. And then, and then I can't, can't de then I can't debate people as much because once they start speaking to me in Spanish, I have to I have to reel it back in. Okay. Well, it sounds like a great. Uh, it would be a wonderful journey. Yeah. And a cool show. What do you uh, What do you hope to do in like years to come? Like we're we're post COVID. Or at least what I'd like to call the, the main <laughs> the main shock of COVID is over. Um, what do you hope to do like in the next five years? Um, I hope to have uh, attained that master's degree I mentioned. Uh, do a bit of counseling, um, AMPA conventions, you know, national convention, more travel and teaching. Um, maybe to have a my book published. You know, I'm working on a, um, a case study right now on cupping and taping. Someone said, someone told me that there was a, a gentleman who had gone into PT because he had fallen. He was an older man and he had bruises all over his legs. Well, they, they put a bunch of tape on him, I guess, to help him maybe feel a little bit more stable or I don't know why they put the tape. But when they took it off, the bruises were gone where the tape was. Hmm. So a lot of people don't like cupping and I don't, you know, unless the client thinks that the bruises are beneficial, 
uh, that's never my goal to leave a bruise on a client ever. Um, and I tend to not leave them, but a, someone brought it to my attention. Well, what about this experiment? What if you did um, a case study where you cupped both sides of a client's back and then just taped one side and did the tape uh, help with that post cupping uh, petechiae that can be left? And maybe that becomes part of safe practices of, um, of the use of cups. So I thought, um, so I'm, you know, still working on that, but, um, you know, continuing to write classes, one that will be, um, that I expect to be, uh, approved soon by NCBTMB is my class on massage and transgender population. Oh, that's um, an interesting. Yeah. That's an interesting topic. Yeah. Um, so, you know, the class is written, it's been submitted. And um, I just got an email from them a few days ago requesting a timeline. So I expect it to be approved soon. And I would like to take take that class um, everywhere so that, ev you know, to help break down some barriers so that everyone has access to quality care. Massage practice itself over the years really forced me past, I don't know how to say this, um, being from Louisiana, I looked at music and food, anybody's culture. I want to know what you got to eat and what kind of music you got. And I think that says a lot about me having grown up in Louisiana that I even think that way. So when I deal with people from a body work sensibility, it allowed me to reach out to people across sex and gender line. It was mm -hmm. like if somebody was a Muslim and, you know, whatever, and had like a totally different cultural background, I could still connect with them using touch in a way that was like culturally, you know, appropriate. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I run the Thai Massage Jam and I always think about the Thai Massage Jam going to like Muslim countries and thinking like, well, I think in some countries, like men and women don't mix the same way. But then at the Thai Massage Jam, like if women wearing hijabs were like working on each other, they could probably be allowed to do that. And I always wonder, what does the Muslim Thai Massage Jam look like? And I'm like, that's, mm -hmm. to me, that's amazing because it's clothes on. So it allows that sort of, you know, interaction. So little things about culture and gender stuff, I'm very open. Like, I just don't really, I don't know, never, I'm very, uh, let's say, uh, what's the way to say it? I'm socially progressive. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds very politically correct that way. <laughs> well, I just have a true love for people. I um, like to connect with people. I like to find things that, uh, we have in common, like, like for instance, you and I are were born five months apart. I thought that was kind of cool. I noticed uh, some some things that you post. I don't know if it was a, a you know, something with one some kind of eighties movie. And I was like, I bet we're the same age. And sure enough, we are. <laughs> but um, you know, I I drape everyone the same. I, would, I guess it's called gender neutral draping. So uh, in that respect. Um, the, the sex of the person, the gender of the person is not really relevant if everybody's draped the same. But I like the, the class is about, um, what the common pronouns are in the LGBTQ community, yeah. what it, uh, what gender, uh, what gender dysphoria is and, um, talking about different top surgeries. Um, so a, a, a masculine life masculinizing surgery or feminizing surgery, what that might look like, uh, with the top, you know, top surgery and then, uh, different protocols for each stage of the wound healing process. Um, you know, post-surgical massage. Um, so that's been a really good class uh, that I'm really proud of and I'm really excited to present it. Have you, have you taught it before? Uh, yeah, taught it a few times. Uh, but uh, I'd like to take it, you know, take it to AMTA. Yeah. I think it's have worthy. You, have you looked at um, any online education for expansion at all? Um, yeah, my classes are available online, uh, in person, or blended. So uh, I have all of my stuff loaded on Google Classroom. So when you purchase a class from my website, um, uh, a link is emailed to you. Oh, nice. And, um, and so everything's on there where you can, you know, it's got videos and yeah. um, a PowerPoint report, exam, uh, evaluation, all of the stuff. And then you just email me when you're done and I send you your certificate in a reply email. 
So, yeah, Louisiana is uh, does allow uh, CEs to be completed online. Yeah, e- each state, like, diff- different rules. I don't even know. Does Louisiana allow, like, h- hands-on instruction online? Like, as long as it's, in my case, if it's nationally approved, I think they do. Yeah, they do. Yeah. It, it, you know, Louisiana, if, um, yes, Louisiana approved, Louisiana board approved, uh, they do. They allow in person or, or online. Yeah. Yeah, I... Man, I'm a huge proponent of online education, but the thing that's been the most challenging post-COVID is I never imagined that the thing I was doing for supplementation became so big that it ate my business where I'm having a problem getting back to in-person education. When I talk Mm -hmm. to students about it, they're like, what? And I'm like, um... How about I turn on cameras uh, five days a week, two hours a day, 52 weeks a year, and give you another 500 hours of footage every year? And they go, what? And I go, I could just live stream two hours a day, five days a week. You have no travel costs. Well, how much does it cost? I'm like, $7 a month. And they're like, how the hell would you? I'm like, well, if I had 10,000 subscribers, I'd make $840,000 a year. And they're like, wait, what? And I go, uh... Uh, cool. Uh, so you mean to come to Louisiana? <laughs> because I can't, you can't force them. You just like continue to provide stuff and just work with them where they are. But yeah. the online education, I was already starting or doing it pretty heavily before COVID, but COVID definitely bumped the dial towards online. And I've had such a success rate uh, teaching from four camera angles live interactively through Zoom that the students freak out and they're just like, oh my God, I don't have to travel. And I'm like, yes, like it drastically reduces like the cost of, you know, education. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, my friend Kelly Mentor told me about you a few years ago or maybe a couple of years ago about your subscription. Um, it, and she just, she loves it. She's a big fan yeah. of yours. And I, I, yeah, I think that's really cool they can complete all of their hours and uh, have access to these videos. And she said you upload, upload new things all the time and, yeah. you know, have all these tips. And I just think that's great. I love it. Yeah. I, I don't know. I mean, I just continue using the technology where it's at. And just like anybody else, I just grow in my concept, if you want to call it that, of what, what I can potentially do and how I can supplement to be able to help students. So, Mm-hmm. I just keep adding things. It's a little bit like, again, the students, they can learn the body work, but I think they have more of a challenge with the business. So they would kind of go, I don't understand. Why do you have a podcast? What's the, and I go, why do I have a podcast? And they're like, yeah, but like, you don't, you know, you don't make like money talking with and interviewing Christy. And I go, um, guys, so we have a podcast. This will go on YouTube. I promote you. You promote me. Your students know about me and vice versa. And I get to like put out more social media content so people know who I am. Like, do you deem me more professional because I have a podcast? And they're like, yeah. And I'm like, that's why I have a podcast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like, um, and I noticed, I noticed that you're near 100 um, episodes. Is that right? Um, oh, yeah. I'd have to go on the Anchor, uh, or it used to be Anchor. Now it's Spotify for podcasters. Um, I'd have to go check. Um, some of the like seasons and episodes are confusing the way it's like organized. But, yeah, I, would, I wouldn't doubt that we're getting close to 100. Did you know that the mm-hmm. – a- I, I, somebody told me this years ago. The average podcast only has like five episodes or something. I didn't know. Because I guess people start podcasts and then drop them. My 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 saving grace is uh, a really ongoing tenacity. <laughs> I'm like, even if you do it poorly, just keep making podcasts and just keep going. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Your 100th show should be with someone like, uh, I don't know, what do I have right here? Robert Sapolsky or somebody. Who, who's that? Robert Sapolsky, I think he is a um, chief 
was he presented at one of the San Diego Pain Summits, maybe maybe the first one. Yeah. I think he's a neuroendocrinologist that taught at Stanford or somewhere. He studied these. I, I just love this guy. He's a great storyteller, and uh, so that's one reason that I love him. But uh, he's a brilliant man. He spent uh, I don't know how many summers uh, studying the um, the effects of stress on I believe it was chimpanzees. Interesting. And uh, so the, you know, the more dominant males have very high uh, testosterone, but low, I think, cortisol, vice versa for the one that everybody picks on. And so he, his research, uh, you know, he, through his research, he discovered many things. But uh, one of the, his books is called uh, Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers. Interesting. Um, so, you know, as, and so what the book is about basically is long-term effects of stress on health, you know, and why don't zebras get ulcers? So the, you know, they're, they live in a very dangerous, they have a very dangerous life. You know, they're grazing, lion comes in, takes, takes out one of the, the, their herd. And, uh, you know, 10 minutes later, they're back grazing again. And so they don't worry about this lady that cut us off in the store, you know, two weeks ago and just, ruminate <laughs> like I tend to and uh yeah so he would be a, an amazing person to interview for yeah, your 100th it should be someone spectacular yeah the the goal was to get the podcast going and then branch out into other interests um mm -hmm. one of my more memorable podcasts was I had a gentleman on who was talking about Texas history which I don't know a lot about because I grew up in Louisiana, so we studied Louisiana history. So having him on and talking about Texas history and whatever else was super interesting. But I can hear people, much like my poker uh, playing and liquor reviews, they're like, what does it have to do with massage and body work? And I'm like, nothing. Nothing. <laughs> it's, but it's interesting. It's because it's fun. And here's what I think is interesting. So like poker stuff and like liquor, they're like, what? This doesn't have anything to do with body work. And I'm like, ah, but once I go to Oaxaca, and start going to the distilleries, then you're going to go, oh, once I'm sitting at that, you know, poker table in Oaxaca, hanging out with some guys, speaking Spanish, you know, playing, then it'll make more sense contextually. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So for me, I love the uh, sharing and exchanging of information that podcasts allow to mm -hmm. take new ideas and promote it to an audience. Yeah, I think it's great what you're doing. Debatable, but <laughs> <laughs> depends on who you ask. <laughs> so the uh, the long term goals, like we were asking about, like the next five years. Do you see yourself moving more and more towards like continuing education and then travel? Is that more like specifically what you're hoping to do? I I think that I'm always uh, going to have clients. I'm always going to um, teach at at the massage school or at a massage school. I, I mean, the the LIMT as long as they'll have me. Yeah. Um, to keep my game sharp, and because I just love it so much, I'd be sad if uh, I think I'll do it until I I can't anymore, until it doesn't make sense to stay, because I'm so busy, you know, traveling and, and trying to manage everything that I've got going on. Oh. But I'll do it as long as I can because I love them. Uh, I love I love all everything that I'm doing. I love it equally. You know, I'd be sad if I didn't have school. Even after I get my master's degree, I may continue because, uh, you know, I just enjoy the experience. It's the best thing that I've ever done for myself, and it it feeds everything that I'm doing. I never would have had the courage to to write a class. I never would have had. Uh, you know, it's just given me a lot of confidence. Um, so yeah, I'll do it, do them all till the wheels come off. Yeah. I'm, I'm very, um, I have a strong work ethic, which I find interesting. Um, like people talk about whether they, they get writer's block or whether they're a self starter and I go self starter. Like I remember, uh, years ago living in my home at the time when a roommate and it was like Saturday night at like midnight and he was like, Robert, are you working? And I'm like, yeah. He's like, Robert, it's Saturday night. It's midnight. And I'm like, well, it sounds like somebody doesn't have hopes and dreams. <laughs> 
Like nobody's making me do it. Like I, I love it. It's fun. You know, yeah, to me, yeah, yeah. So I think uh, like conversations about work life balance can get super weird. They're like, Robert, you're too, you're too immersed in your work. And I'm like, you know, it's like, I'm not telling everybody to do what I do. Like, I don't, I don't think Mm -hmm. it would work for a lot of people, but it depends on like what your long-term goals are, what you're, what you're trying to accomplish. Um, Mm -hmm. Even with like, I don't teach in core curriculum for very specific reasons. I don't think it would work for me, but it's not something where I burn bridges. Like I try to keep friendly alliances, I guess, with other educators and school owners and professional organizations. I try not to burn bridges, even though my opinions might be contrary to the mainstream industry in some ways. Um, Mm -hmm. I don't really know the, the whole, the whole thing, like online education, for instance, seems to be controversial in core curriculum specifically. And I think there's some fear because they don't know, like, it's not just massage education, education itself as an entire industry from, you know, preschool to, you know, graduate level college is like changing because of internet based technologies. So it, it's kind of this weird thing. I don't, as somebody who went to school and, you know, in the 80s, and that was what you dealt with, and that's how it was at public school in Louisiana, it's really hard to think about access to global data at students' fingertips. Like, when I look at a chat GPT, for instance, like, what are people doing to write essays now? Like, mm-hmm. I don't even know how, how educators deal with that. Um, the, the modern world is just completely different than when I was playing Atari as a kid. It was the best day ever. Um, and what's it going to be like with these VR headsets and, um, where maybe everyone will have one and we get to teach with those. Maybe there is a, the gloves that we put on, you can actually feel a person under your hand and teach online that way. How cool is that can be? Yeah, we, we've already started looking at like, um, like 3D cameras and stuff to be able to figure out if I could set up a virtual classroom that way. Uh, what mm-hmm. I'm doing now is good enough and I think pretty cutting edge for the industry, but mm-hmm. I don't see the technology slowing down in any way. So it's mm-hmm. kind of interesting to to look at. And again, it's, it's like I think there's a... A larger tendency in the public to engage in some sort of fundamentalism. Technology is changing so fast, people want to hang on to truth with a capital T. Like they're they're starting to freak out that nobody knows what's real anymore. Like the fake news, the you know, on and on and on. And it's like It's because people are so bombarded with information in a way that just wasn't available with Encyclopedia Britannica when I was a kid. Like, you know, TV went off at night. (laughs) There were there were five channels. It's Mm -hmm. like as things have continued to expand, it's just this never ending onslaught of information. And then what do you choose to believe? Like the, the whole world seems to be in a very different space. Um, intellectually, probably dealing with things that, frankly, we just we have never dealt with before. So there aren't really scripted solutions to some of the stuff we're discussing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Then for you, uh, the school that you're at, do you own the school? I don't. Mm-hmm. So you just teach there? Yeah. Are there a yes, host of I other do. teachers? Yeah. Uh, I each uh, of the three classes that are going on have, have has its own group of teachers, which we all support one another. If someone needs to take a day off or something, we're always there to, to help out. And it's great to meet at the other the other groups. Yeah. Cohort. Yeah. The mm-hmm. uh, massage uh, community, other than doing like a, a modality day in a school, um, I've mainly uh, stayed out of core curriculum. Uh, just to focus on CE classes, which has been more my cup of tea to uh, continue Mm -hmm. expanding. It's been super interesting to continue to put out information and like we're looking at partner massage classes online, things like that. 
um, maybe expanding past massage therapists at some point and teaching the public directly um, and teaching different audiences. I find it difficult to sort of switch gears in my head because like the public has a different knowledge base than yoga teachers, personal trainers, massage therapists, and then devising curriculum for each group that's slightly different based on their needs is a little more uh, challenging because I'm used to dealing with people who already know the anatomy. You know, when I talk about the bicep or the tricep, they have a general idea of origin insertion. Yeah. So I don't know why we didn't discuss this uh, earlier on. We did mention fish uh, very briefly. How did you get into like jam bands? Um, whenever I moved to Lake Charles, uh, I'm, a, I'm from a little town. I mean, you lived in Baton Rouge. Do you remember Mamu? Oh, I know Mamu, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I'm from Mamu. <laughs> so whenever I moved to Lake Charles, um, I came here to, to go to massage school, like I said. And so um, I moved to Welsh. Uh, I have had family there, kind of helped me get on my feet. And uh, ended up getting a job at a um, at a gym, and so I, I moved here. So I didn't really know anybody, and uh, so you know, I just kind of a lot of uh, people my age at that time were going; they were in college. So you know, I just tried to make friends wherever I could, and I ended up finding my people, and they were musicians. They were uh, going to see shows. They were at festivals. Um, and that's where I found my crew. And yeah. so they introduced me to, um, you know, government mule and widespread panic and grateful dead and, and just all of these amazing bands and just all of this great music. Um, and uh, I mean, I found I just fell right in love with it. Yeah. And, uh, just kind of took off with that. And, uh, yeah, I'll see panic in uh, Huntsville in July. I just saw um, my morning jacket in uh, Jackson last week, and I had never seen them before. I've been hearing about them through other friends, but when they played Victory Dance, I was like, "All right, you got me." Yeah, you know. So, yeah, I sort of dropped out of the scene for a while, uh, living in Texas and working on my my business. Not because I lost interest, but just because I was busy, you know, d dealing with other things. But uh, it was pretty pretty heavy in college. A lot of fish, uh, string cheese incident, and Keller Williams for a while. There was mm -hmm. a period there from like ninety seven to two thousand or so that was pretty heavy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Then, uh, uh, fish, uh, fortunately, is like I tell people. Like I almost, it's weird because I love fish, but I almost bring up fish at parties just to hear people complain. <laughs> Like, I hate fish. I hate fish fans. They're horrible. And I'm like, yeah, tell me about it. <laughs> <laughs> what do they not like? The long jams? Or... I think yeah. people, some people like the song to end at 3 minutes, 22 seconds. Let's yeah. get on with it. I'm like, Structure. no, I never. Take me somewhere. Structure. Take me to yeah. a place. It's like they want, and it's like, I, I'm, I don't know. I, it's interesting. I'm, I got away from the scene for a while just because I was busy. And then I go back to it and I see certain things. And then you realize, like, man, Big Cypress was 23 years ago. Like, you're like that old deadhead at this point. He's talking about that show he saw in 1970 or whatever. It's like, it's a, it's a different scene. Like, the technology has changed and, and whatever. The, the thing about Fish is I felt like the Grateful Dead was a little bit more relatable because it was roots music. Fish never, in my opinion, they never tried to be something they weren't. Like, they were influenced by Roots music and maybe added some bluegrass and stuff here and there, some barbershop quartet. But when people would talk to me about Fish, it was like they didn't like the fact that it kept changing. Mm -hmm. It was like, yeah, this piece sounds like the Red Hot Chili Peppers, but this piece sounds like Frank Zappa, and this piece sounds like, you know, like orchestral music or something. And when people would ask me, I'd go, listen, Fish is a jazz quartet that plays rock instruments. They're kids who grew up in New Jersey at the mall and listen to Jimi Hendrix. They, they had different influences. They're, they're East Coast kids. They, 
you know, have a different background. I love it because it's improvisational. Like I, I loved prog rock and kind of what they were doing, uh, still do. But when other people hate it, I also understand why, if that makes sense. Like it definitely stands out like a sore thumb. And much like the Grateful Dead, I think the real problem is not the band and it's not their music, it's their fans. Their fans are super annoying. <laughs> <laughs> because you find somebody who likes fish and that's what they're going to talk about at the party for two hours and some religious experience <laughs> they had on acid at some show. And it's like that same thing is like the Grateful Dead to me in their demeanor were very different than their fans. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's like the Grateful Dead to me were, you know, sort of like West coast anarchists essentially. Um, t totally different influences, you know, as far as roots music. I could understand why somebody could get the Grateful Dead much faster than they could Fish. Fish was like, uh, it's just a latter era. It just in different musical influences that just don't don't lead towards like roots music. And there was nothing about Fish to me that was like same as the Grateful Dead. They weren't trying to produce like the seminal album. This was not the Eagles. Mm -hmm. Like, you never wanted to hear the same song twice. The the people who kept but saying... But if you did... Yeah, the people who kept saying it, it changes. The thing that was cool was, to me, it was like... Um, like uh, orchestral music when I was in band in high school, you'd have like an A section and a B section and an A section again. Like, they would revisit a theme. I mm -hmm. loved that about Fish and the Grateful Dead, that they would go through changes and you know in a song. Yeah, for other sandwich people, other song. They're like the song is fifteen minutes long. What what the and I'm like, oh, because once you understood the structure, then you knew okay, this is the structured piece of David Bowie. Here's where the oh, here's where the solo begins. Here's where the improv begins, and they step off. They're they're using it as a springboard for improvisation, and for me, it was like some albums are nice. But the experience was always live. It was always Absolutely. like an adventure. And I think, like, I went up to New York in 97 for a series of shows at Madison Square Garden to see Fish. And the, the, the friends and family I was staying with were like, you're seeing the same band three days in a row? And I go, yes. And they're like, mm -hmm. is it the same show? And I'm like, no, nah, they probably won't even repeat a song for those three days. And they're like, what? <laughs> I mean, right. I mean, as that's a what I always loved about widespread. Yeah. Um, because I mean, they, I've, I've seen panic, I think 80 times at my oh, last count. Wow. Man, you could tell some stories. Yeah. I mean, I've seen them at Bonnaroo. I've seen them at Vegas. I've seen them at Red Rocks and, you know, we're basically traveling, uh, you know, seeing the world, watching our favorite bands, you yeah. know? When, and so all of the, every vacation that I that I used to go on was centered around where they were. <laughs> and so it was ex an experience around an experience. Yeah. You were talking earlier about roots and panic is like Southern rock, yeah. you know, just, and they just speak to my soul. I just, I just love them. Yeah. And, um, when did you know, you, I, I love fish. I love other bands. When did you start listening to widespread panic? In the late nineties. So when Hauser like was still same around? time that, yeah, I did yeah. get to see Hauser's last. Um, so we we did, um, we did some Texas shows. We did Bonnaroo, and then we did and we did uh, Red Rocks, and I think those were Hauser's last. Yeah, uh, they were of his last shows. So yeah, I, I was uh, lucky enough to be able to see him. Yeah, I know. But I love me some Jimmy. Yeah, I never went. I never went crazy about widespread. Like it was never, like not even really in my top five. But there was something about them. Like when again, when people would ask me, like Fish, I'm like, it's a jazz quartet that plays rock instruments, and they're like, widespread. I'm like, it's Latter Day Almond Brothers. Like as a cliche, it's Southern rock, and they're like, oh, okay. And the, the album for me was Ain't Life Grand. I still put mm -hmm. Ain't Life Grand on regularly because I think the album yeah. is just 
this perfect snapshot of like a time and a place. And again, remember I said uh, moving, moving to Pennsylvania? Yeah. I was, I'm not lying. <laughs> I was dri driving down the highway in Pennsylvania, <laughs> listening to Ain't Life Grand. And I was like, I had this weird, I'd been there a month. I'd been to Pennsylvania for a month. And I had this weird re revelation driving down the highway, listening to widespread panic. And I was like, Robert, you were Scott Irish by ancestry and you burn in the sun real easy. But culturally, you are black. <laughs> it's like you grew up in the goddamn South where this shit is just everywhere. Like it was like it was such a stark contrast, like driving down the highway, listening to this Latter day Almond Brothers, Southern Rock, you know, and it was like the context for where I was at was like New England. Like it had a totally different like vibe, you know, culturally. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, uh, how, so you've seen them a few times, Panic? Yeah, I'm trying to think. Um, I saw them at UNO Lakefront Arena many years ago with Hauser. Yeah, that, those are always that, good. Yeah, those that might have been the only time that I saw them. Um, I've seen. It had to be Halloween. Yeah, I've seen Government Mule in several different um, incarnations. Um, but yeah, I think I think widespread was only that one time live, and I never. I don't know. It was like there was only so much time, so I just never dedicated a lot of time to like bootlegs of them, for instance, and like digging mm -hmm. through uh, widespread fans to find out more seminal shows of, you know, uh, I don't know. So the, the hardcore fans, and that's the thing people don't get. It's like, well, no, but there was a show in 97 at the Madison Square Garden. It was 1229, and, you know, they did their antelope at the end, and, you know, the yeah. improv was great, and the way the, the room moved. Or, you know, the, once people start talking about that, they're like, God, I hate fish fans. <laughs> but that's the yeah. thing that, that fans remember. I mean, for instance, you've seen widespread, you know, a lot of times. Like, do you have one or two, like, favorite shows? Yeah. Where it all came together. Yeah. Absolutely. See, and every, um, every jam band fan does. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, Bonnaroo, uh, they, they were playing uh, Tall Boy. Um, Dottie Peoples comes out and sings Testify. And so there's some in the Holy Ghost. Shit, the Holy Ghost. I mean, it was like nobody was playing at Bonnaroo at that time. Uh, so all the at the same time as Panic, nobody else was playing. Yeah. So all 80,000 people were jumping up and down uh, and like singing, somebody ought to testify. <laughs> and she just, she had it, man. I'm telling you, it was spiritual. It was like being, at, it was church for yeah. me. And just even my heart is racing, just thinking about being back there again. It was wonderful. Yeah. That was, that was the number one, but there's been many, but that was the one she got me. Yeah. So many like um somebody was asking me about this like remembering certain people and um i remember certain friends not from like these ultimate you know spiritual experiences but from just some random conversation friends that are long gone and you just remember this funny conversation you had in a car one time and the jam band shows you can never figure out like what's going to stick what's going to be the memory you know, both good and bad that like sticks with you. But I can think about it and there's some that are huge concerts like Big Cypress with 100,000 people there. And there's others mm -hmm. like I remember seeing Keller Williams at Tipitina's in New Orleans. And the way you can put yourself because nobody was there. I mean, there, there must have been 20 people in the whole damn thing. And I stood right in between the speakers at this focal point where you could see, like you could feel the sound coming from both sides at the same time. This was before Keller was using, this is 98 probably. Um, mm -hmm. It was like, it was just him and a guitar. And it mm -hmm. was like, to me, it was like seeing Neil Young solo. Like it was just like hard to explain all these years later, Keller is still around kicking in various incarnations, but it's hard to explain like the the small tiny shows you've seen to the large things and how like certain concepts or certain like feelings will stick with you like you get excited mm -hmm. describing that moment where i'm hearing it from the outside not even familiar with the song itself mm -hmm. 
yeah, it's, I mean, it's an experience. It, sometimes it, it happens in a large venue, sometimes a small one. Uh, just like you said, you never know what's going to hit you. But, uh, yeah, a lot of the, my, the best memories of my life have been either watching live music, panic or otherwise, or centered around what we're about to do or having what, what we just did. Yeah. You know? I, can, I can become a, a critic very, very fast. And it's really interesting to see, like, <laughs> they talk about fish, I think before the hiatus or whatever, and they're like, fish, it's like fish point one or point two or something, like it's a software update. <laughs> and they're arguing about different eras. And it's like, I'm just not an old head who's like, this was so much better in 98 when I started, you know. I, I'm just like, just let people enjoy what they enjoy. Like, why does it... Why does it matter? It would be like, I don't have any problem with the intellectual discussion about widespread panic pre-Hauser and post or government mule pre and post Alan Woody. Um, right. Like, I think it's interesting to discuss, you know, but it's not something that I care to hold in any kind of religious sensibility, if that, if you will. Yeah. It's just your preference. Ah, I got to... I got to do work while I'm working. <laughs> People are like, can you screenshot? Yes, here you go. Um, yeah, it's super, super interesting to think that bands I've listened to have been around for, you know, 30 years. And to think about the way that uh, I have gray hair now. <laughs> I'm, I'm older, you know, than I was. Also, music itself, like we talked about educational shifts. Um, when I started listening to jam bands, it was by trading tapes for blanks and postage in the U S mail. Now, most bands are like streaming their own concerts that you can just, you know, buy and purchase a yeah. lot of that technological distribution. I even wrote articles about the grateful dead and fish and the way that they were building a cult like following through uh, video distribution, which is essentially something that I modeled, but for massage education. Where it was like, why not just record the whole class and give it to them? Everybody was like, no, you they're not going to pay for class if they can get it for free. And I'm like, are you sure? <laughs> it's like... Mark. It's the same thing. The, 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 the tapers, uh, before the band started just recording their own shows, the tapers were just forming like a an underground like marketing wing for the bands to be able to give the tapes to friends and, and such and spread the good word, so to speak. So mm -hmm. it's been interesting to see the shifts in technology and how it's influenced the scene itself. Because there used to be the shows that got away that nobody had. It was a like rumor. Did somebody record this or does it exist? And that so much in 2023 just doesn't seem to exist as much anymore. The shows don't escape. Because yeah. we have our computer in our pocket. And get, getting to a point where I got into fish first. I never saw the Grateful Dead. Um, I've seen like Dead and Company and a few side, Brad Dog, a few few side yeah. projects. Because um, Jerry died in 95, and that's uh, when I graduated high school. So I didn't have any, any inkling. It wasn't until 96 or so that I started listening to fish. And mm -hmm. then it was like you kind of went backwards because some some guy would send you an extra Grateful Dead disc and you're like, who's this? I don't know. I, I listen to Fish. What is this Grateful Dead thing? And then I listened to them and I almost had a deeper affinity for the dead almost quickly, um, even through recordings. And the more I heard and the more I heard Jerry Garcia band and the more I heard Grateful Dead shows, I was like, oh, wow. And I was sad. I was like, man, I'll, I'll never be able to see these guys like play but what i never really understood was the fact that the influences they had had like blossomed this whole like jam band scene in a sense mm -hmm. like it wasn't i hate to say this it wasn't really gone it was kind of like lamenting that i'd never see Jimi hendrix live knowing that you know Jimi hendrix influenced all these other guitarists the steve ray vaughn or whoever and yeah continue to continue to, continue to expand yeah what uh? What are you excited to be able to go uh, catch and see as far as music is concerned? Anything? Well, upcoming? I'm really looking forward uh, to Panic in um, in Huntsville 
I'm going with a friend of mine. We're taking the RV. We're going to uh, stop in New Orleans and uh, visit some friends, and I'm sure see, you know, someone, hopefully George. And then we're going to go George, off to George Tennessee. George Porter Jr.? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I knew who um, George was, but if you're not from Louisiana, people are like, George, who's, <laughs> who's this random guy, George? <laughs> <laughs> He's the mayor. So, yeah, and then we're going to go off to um, – to Nashville and uh, see some more friends, and so we've got you know lots of traveling and music coming up. Nice, but uh, yeah, cool. So we're up on uh, uh, close to two hours. We're about fifteen minutes shy. Uh, do you have any closing thoughts? Well, I just wanted to thank you so much for including me and for inviting me to join you today. It means a lot. It really does. I appreciate it. Yeah. And uh, I'm a fan of yours, and so I really appreciate. Being included, and um, <laughs> yeah, if there's ever anything that I can do, you know, to help you or whatever, please ask me. Sure, for yeah, you. yeah. If you ever uh, want to be on the podcast again, something comes up, you need help, uh, you want to discuss something in particular, just let me know. Um, I just do these with a, a wide range of people to continue to like network and communicate with people about massage related stuff. The fact that we had uh, like jam band history was kind of interesting because I don't normally get a chance to talk about that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, cool. So uh, probably above you is your uh, website, and then below you is your social media follows. Um, you guys go ahead and follow Christy wherever you are on social media, and I think I will uh, talk to you again soon. Okay, thank you. Thank you guys so much for tuning in to the Robert Gardner Wellness Podcast. Appreciate you.